It's one of the world's largest and most influential scientific congresses for anesthesiology and intensive care. After two years of virtual editions of the Congress, we're officially back in person in the beautiful city of Milan. The global anesthesia community is finally able to reunite, interact, have face-to-face -face debates and discuss the latest ideas and innovations in the field. It's Euro Anesthesia 2022 and we're Euro Anesthesia TV. Welcome back to Euro Anesthesia TV and to our final show from Euro Anesthesia 2022. So far, we've been hearing about some of the very latest in anesthesia and intensive care medicine, from artificial intelligence in drug delivery to post-operative delirium, and all about innovations in medical education and training. And there's still so much more to come. On our final show today, we discuss the top intensive care publications selected by Professor Paolo Pelosi take a final tour of organizations across the world, from Edwards Life Sciences to Kepler University Hospital, get hands-on training at the simulation labs, and explore the interplay between genomics and anesthesia. First though, let's find out how the ASAIC Trainee Committee is enriching and supporting the next generation of doctors. The ASAIC Trainee Committee is a collection of international people working to connect all anesthesiology and intensive care trainees in Europe together. We have about 22,000 anesthesiology trainees on the continent and our mission is to unite, connect them and support them the best way we can. So we have like four task forces. So the first task force is like social media. The second one would be the international and European trainee section. The third one would be the educational task board and the last one, you and anesthesia. Uh, education task force uh, is looking to create new projects to ease our way into becoming anesthetists and to ease our way into transitioning from being med students and to take resp responsibility. I am the one of the two social media coordinators. We want to be the link between the 22,000 active trainees all over Europe uh, between them and the actual education of anesthesiology. ASAIC can offer that through grants and fellowships and the trainees committee is the best way to engage uh, trainees from all over Europe. We host, for example, a once a month Facebook live sessions where one professor and distinctive professor gives a lecture live and anyone can ask their questions or comment on this very specific and important topic. I'm the coordinator of Aeronesthesia Task Force and our mission is to uh, trying to coordinate and make uh, the most pleasant experience for the trainees that come here to the, to the Congress to try to broaden as much as possible those social activities and make uh, the best out of our stay here in Minano and uh, all the cities that we're going to stay. I think the Euro Anesthesia is the most important event for us as trainees and uh, for entities all over Europe because here you come to get an update with all the information in anesthesia. We get great workshops and uh, we get uh, simulation and basically you find out what we do in SAIC and how can you join us and how can you profit for us. They can connect with other trainees, expand their horizons and really just, just come hang out and pass a really good time. Uh, being a member offers you so many uh, advantages and so many possibilities. We, as members of the Trainees Committee, are dedicated to help the future anesthesiologists to actually become the doctors they want to be. Well, if you're not already, then do make sure to become a member of ASAIC. Well, now let's welcome Professor Paolo Pelosi to talk us through some of the top intensive care publications. Professor Pelosi, thank you so much for stopping by. Just first of all, could you tell us what type of publications you selected from? I tried to select a publication uh, mainly focused on uh, 
uh, respiratory management of critical ill patients uh, and moving from uh, intubation to personalized mechanical ventilation, weaning phase uh, and the role of non-invasive respiratory support. Well, let's start with Dr. Vincenzo Rossotto's study on peri-intubation events in critically ill patients. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Uh, yes, this was a multinational worldwide study looking at the intubation practices uh, and adverse events uh, in critical ill patients. And we found that cardiovascular instability was uh, more frequent than we expected, uh, as well uh, as uh, epoxia. So the message of the study is uh, to take care of this risky procedure in these patients, uh, especially outside the ICU. So next we have mechanical power in ventilated patients by Dr. Eduardo Costa. Why is this one of your top picks? This is a very important study from a clinical point of view that found that mechanical power, which is the energy delivered by the ventilator uh, to the patient, was uh, independently associated with outcome. And even more importantly, they found the difference between plateau pressure and PEEP was even more important than respiratory rate to determine mechanical power. And these data are recently confirmed also in different population of non-RDS patients. Moving on to another interesting study by Dr. Karen Burns, looking at the practice of invasive mechanical ventilation on critically ill patients. What were the main findings of the study? This was also a multinational uh, worldwide study. We found that uh, the ventilator weaning and uh, discontinuation practice uh, uh, in critical ill patients were different uh, between uh, different countries. And we also found that uh, the weaning phase is very important uh, to determine outcome of our patients. So the suggestion is to have uh, local guidelines uh, for uh, weaning procedures uh, in the intensive care. And finally, a study by Professor Gavin Perkins comparing the effect of non-invasive respiratory strategies versus conventional oxygen therapy among patients with COVID-19 related acute hypersemic respiratory failure. What were the results of the clinical trial? This is a very important uh, clinical study, clearly showing that non-invasive CPAP led to a better outcome uh, as compared to high flow uh, oxygen nasal therapy or standard therapy in this patient. But this study opened a new view in the role of non-invasive respiratory support in hypoxemic patients. So CPAP is probably the best method to support this patient before intubation. Professor Pelosi, it's been fantastic to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Remember, you can watch Euro Anesthesia TV here at the Milano Convention Center. Find us on the Euro Anesthesia 2022 website, on the virtual platform, on the meeting app, and on YouTube and Twitter. Some excellent studies from the authors there. Now let's go to Switzerland and take a look at Edward's life sciences. They're developing breakthrough innovations that allow intensivists and anaesthetists to provide safer pathways for patients as they go from ER to OR and to the ICU. Let's take a look. One of the main challenges that the physicians are faced with in the perioperative pathway is uh, what we call hypertension. This is a drop in the blood pressure of the patients. Edwards Life Science is pioneering the field of artificial intelligence for anesthesia and intensive care. The Hypertension Predictive Index, HPI, is the first predictive algorithm that is brought to these specialties. HPI is the most important thing I've seen in the last 10 years in the field of uh, anesthesia monitoring. We have the opportunity to change our management from a reactive blood pressure measurement, that is waiting until the hypertension occurs and then treating it, to a proactive treatment, that is preventing the hypertension before it actually occurs. And this is a real game changer. Everything we do is through collaboration with physicians. And we're going to continue to use artificial intelligence in order to help them address unmet clinical need to improve patient safety. Now for our final stop, let's visit the Kepler University Hospital in Austria. It's a young and dynamic hospital that provides best-in-class clinical training to new anesthesiologists and intensivists. 
I chose to work at Kepler University Hospital because of the medical diversity in the Department for Anesthesiology. 24 years ago I chose this hospital because of the opportunity to get a broad spectrum uh, education. It delivers every field of anesthesia one would imagine in education for, an, for being an anesthesiologist. Being a young hospital gives a lot of opportunities. If you work in a well-established hospital where all the borders and all the goals have been set for many, many years, there is not too much place for development. In our setting, if you are young and strong and have enough power, you can change nearly everything. For me, Kepler University the Hospital is the place to be for learning and practicing anesthesia, uh, intensive care medicine and emergency medicine in, in the region of Upper Austria. Coming up, we'll discuss genomics and anesthesia with Dr. Ruth Landau. But first, let's head to the simulation lab and see what's happening there. So I'm going to teach you how to intubate the mannequin. Great, okay. It's a video laryngoscope. Yep. So you're going to have the image uh, that's displayed from the camera at the tip. So you okay. insert it in the mouse. Okay. Yeah, you see this is the tip of the epiglottis. Yep. Just stop here and you lift a little bit. No, not like that. You're going to break the teeth. Ah, sorry. So hop, like that. Okay. <laughs> You follow the curve. Let me help you a little bit. Yeah, I need it, don't I? It's a good job this is a simulation, huh? Yeah. The Simulation Lab is a simulation platform where you can learn uh, interactively. We basically have two rooms. One is dedicated to high fidelity with the mannequin that's just behind me reconstituting the operating room or the ICU. And the other one is more focused on procedural skills of various skills that are used for anesthesiologists and in intensive care uh, doctors. But also we focus on improving the non-technical skills and the teamwork and communication skills of uh, the participants. They can share experiences. They come from different backgrounds, different uh, way of practicing anesthesia. So it's always is very rich and even us as an instructor we always learn during the session. For me it's very new. I would introduce this uh, as a mandatory experience in, in the hospital. There is an emergency and you need to act fast and you need to decide positions. This will help me to reproduce the experience and to be fast thinking and fast reacting in a, in a real environment. I really enjoyed because there has been a hands-on station and with the ultrasound that is very important because this is the non-invasive method and with all the advantages uh, you also need the training because it's user dependent and for the accuracy and reproducibility that is all you could ask for. Um, the ability to, to do things that you're not comfortable with doing because you're not very familiar with them and learning from your other teammates and hearing about the way they do things in their place. And, uh, and having the facilitators give you feedback, I mean, it's, it's been an absolutely amazing experience. I'll take this to my workplace. Well, I'm delighted now to be joined in the studio by Dr. Ruth Landau. She's one of the presenters from the first live session of the Andreas Hoof Research Session, which this year is on genomics and anesthesia. Dr. Landau, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, what a pleasure. So I wonder if you could start by telling us, what is the interplay between genomics and anesthesiology? Well, there are a lot of possible implications of the human genome and anesthesia outcomes. The first that comes to mind and has been researched quite a lot is the response to drugs that we administer before, during and after anesthesia. But there is much more than that. We know that perioperative outcomes depend on patients uh, status, comorbidities, and that genomics may actually impact the likelihood of having uh, complications related to anesthesia. So what implications then do the genomics have for anesthesia and perioperative care and the outcomes? So that is such an important question. There was a lot of hope and quite a bit of hype with a human genome project completion almost 20 years ago that we would be able to tailor specifically for every patient in every surgery uh, the type of anesthetic and perioperative uh, approach. However, um, the association is not that linear and um, we haven't been able to really progress as much as we would have thought 
to offer the precision medicine or personalized tailored approach that we were hoping for. Can you outline recent developments then in human genetics that have current and future impacts upon anesthesiologists in their clinical practice? So one area where there has been particular research is malignant hyperthermia. But this is also uh, quite complex in the sense that it's not one gene, one outcome. So the complexities have also been that all these um, adverse outcomes are polygenic themselves. But I think there is hope that we will be able to identify uh, in, a, in a better predictive manner who are the individuals that are really at risk of adverse outcomes, including malignant hyperthermia. And just finally, there's a lot of buzz around artificial intelligence in anesthesia. What does the future of perioperative precision medicine look like, do you think? So this is a superb question. We've made a lot of advance on the genomic side, but we also need to make progress in advance with how we integrate the information with the clinical pictures. So we need for that robust analytics. So data analytics, big data, and big cohorts. And I think that artificial intelligence should help us, not in the near future, I think we're still a little road away from that. But we talk about precision medicine, what will it look like in 20 years? Uh, so hopefully for us, when we grow older, our children and grandchildren, we make some robust advances. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Landa, for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting. My pleasure, thank you for having me. And I look forward to seeing where the research goes in that fascinating area. Well, that's all from us here at Euro Anesthesia 2022. And we really hope that you've all enjoyed being back together and in person again. Now, don't worry if you've missed any of our coverage though, because it's all available online. So do just click through to find more clips and shows on all of this year's key topics. But for now, we'll look forward to seeing you in Glasgow in 2023. Goodbye.